the start of a new month. Welcome to the pause for the month of March 2024. My name is Elton Brobe. And coming up in this Friday's edition of your most operated 30 program, the pause, Parliament reconnected to the national grid after settling more than 10 million of the 23 million city debt it owed the electricity company of Ghana. Following yesterday's disconnection that left the house in darkness, and MPs and staff stuck in elevators. We are live in Parliament for the very latest. Also, importers and exporters join calls for the release of a low shedding timetable as the current erratic power supply buys hard on import operations. More as the electricity company of Ghana apologizes for the recent power outages, promising a normalization of the supply starting today. Also this afternoon, eight in every 10 females and seven in every 10 males aged between 15 and 49 who have heard about HIV have discriminatory attitude towards people living with the condition. We have details of a survey by the Ghana Statistical Service as the world marks zero discrimination day. And later in the bulletin, we bring you an exclusive interaction with the majority leader, Alexander Fenyomarkin. The post is brought to you by Global Communities Digilu, affordable, safe sanitation for all. We are live on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV 125. My name is Elton Brobe. Thanks for choosing us. And we are starting from Parliament, and it's a matter that is of concern to a lot of people, especially within the ECG catchment area. The minority in Parliament are demanding that the Energy Minister, Dr. Marty Opoku Prempem, is dragged before MPs who answer questions on the recent power outages. According to the NDC MPs, the intermittent power supply is affecting businesses and homes, making it difficult to plan. Listen to the NDC Member of Parliament for North, Tamale North, Al Hassan Suhinim and Deputy Minority Leader Emmanuel Amakofi Bua making the demand on the floor of Parliament this morning. Many people and businesses are unable to plan their activities and their programs. And they are having to sometimes also find extra money to power the, their generators for their businesses. Many people do not know what is happening. We are told there are planned and unplanned maintenance programs Yet, like I said, there's also the conversation about load that is shared, sometimes between 300 megawatts and all. Mr. Speaker, it is important that the leadership of the House, especially the majority leader, uh, makes it possible for the energy minister to brief the House next week. As we have a report from the supply room. Three days ago, we shared 480 megawatts. Yesterday was 580. Likely today we are sharing 600 megawatts. That's the whole of Ashanti region, Western and Central region. The speaker, it is important that the Minister of Energy brief this house and, 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 uh, and the country about the challenges we face. Well, the majority leader, Alexander Fenyamarkin, had a response for his colleagues. Honorable Matthew Poku Prempe, I'm told, is back to the jurisdiction this afternoon. So there should be no problem. If he is in today and the file and is admitted and it gets to him, I'm sure he will be more than prepared to come. So colleagues, I pray that we consider the urgent question route. And when it comes, members will have the opportunity to ask their supplementary. So clearly the energy minister will have to respond to parliament and then tell them what is responsible for the power outage. But we've got a response from the electricity company of Ghana. We'll bring that to you shortly. Meanwhile, importers and exporters say they are bearing the brunt of the current erratic power supply as the frequent power cuts are said to be affecting port administration, leading to delay in clearing cargo at the port. 
Executive Secretary of the Importers and Exporters Association of Ghana, Samson Asaki Awingobet, wants the Energy Ministry to release a load shedding timetable to avert further losses to the business community. And he joins us via Zoom as we look at this very important uh, matter. Uh, Awingobet, thank you very much for your time. So, how badly are you affected by this erratic power supply? All right, so uh, Awin Gobert will join me shortly, but David Dake, a fit forwarder, uh, will help us appreciate the situation uh, very much. So, David, you're welcome to the post here on Joy News. Thank you very much, sir. So, for example, let's zoom straight to how the, the, the power issue, the unstable power issue, is affecting your business as a fit forwarder. Thank you very much for the question. It delays productivity. You see, when the we have the outages, for instance, the whole day we don't have light. We can't work at the port. Mm. You know, we are running the digital economy now. So it will end up giving us the mortgage, which will end with the end consumer. So that is what is affecting us. Secondly, especially with the RIFA containers, you know, RIFA deals with electricity. So if they don't have it, the goods can go by. That's bad, especially fruits, uh, those running with fruits, uh, meats, right. especially chicken, frozen chicken, it will go back. Even if they have a standby generator, they are going to use fuel, which will end with the end conducer. So it's really affecting us. Individual freight for the free for others can work. And it's affecting us badly. So 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 so, so so David, how are you holding yourself, knowing very well that you are unable to tell when the light will go off and when it will come back? If you have perishable goods, how are you hoping to ensure that they stay in a condition that is good for the export that you want to undertake? Okay, thank you for the question. Gapua is doing well by using their reserves, with the, which is the standby generators they have. But at which cost? That is what we should ask. Because they can't do it for us for free. And it will end with the end consumer. So that by we are managing, we will plead the authorities to help us through. Yes, David. Hello. So, is there any response from Gapoha? Are you getting any assurance that things will stabilize whilst the, 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 the central government provide update as to what it is doing to address this very concern so that you can stay in business? Uh, please, no official communication yet, but we hope to receive one soon, please. All right. Thank you very much, David. He is a businessman who is obviously concerned about the unstable power supply because it's affecting his business into the export of perishable goods and that is having an impact on how uh, he's able to keep uh, the goods in condition that that is necessary for the as well expect power supply to be normalized from today that's the assurance coming from the electricity company of ghana following the recent power outage that affected their catchment areas the minority blame the situation on obsolete equipment and the inability of the country to buy crude oil to power the power plants. But the managing director of the electricity company of Ghana, Samuel Mahama, is denying the claims in system. The outages resulted from unscheduled maintenance work undertaken by one of his power plants sent power. They are big, a big, big, big sorry. Uh, I have to apologize for what has happened in the past few days. I know there's been a lot of speculation. There's been a lot of, uh, what do you call it, a lot of... Um, We've allowed for a space to happen for people to try to plug into the narrative. But uh, the truth of the matter is, most of the narratives out there are all wrong. We are doing our best not to play politics with this matter. When you're, when you're doing a supply outlook, you have to look at the, the, the power plants that are available and all of that. Because you always have to make a blend so that some of them can have their maintenance works done. We had a good plan that we were working on until we were hit by an emergency. And uh, it was an emergency gas valve that couldn't shut down. And you know, it's gas. You have to be very, very careful. So it plunged us into a deficit for power supply. It happened at about 4 p.m. And we were hoping that, you know, it could be fixed faster than that. And uh, as typical as we, we, we went into our moods, we kept on listening to the engineers and, and we played ourselves out of time to be able to speak to the narrative. I would like to take this opportunity to say Doomsaw is not back.
and this is a maintenance issue. We suffered a maintenance setback because, you know, the, the funny thing is everybody knows about ECG, but most people don't know that it's a value chain starting from the generator through the transmitter to ECG. So for ECG, what is given to us is what we distribute. So we, we take full responsibility for the communication gap. We are working on, uh, on, on making sure that now we become more proactive with the communication part of things so everybody can plan ahead. But it is not doing so. As a company, we are not that callous that we will be going into a load shedding and we will not give a timetable for everybody to plan their lives. No, not at all. It's, it was a maintenance issue that got out of hand, and we are sorry about that. As for the revenue mobilization exercise, we, we can't stop. All of these are aimed at reducing our commercial losses. So we are putting boots on the ground, and we also want to be able to make have the moral story that all the requisite state institutions have paid their bills, so the average person doesn't have an excuse not to pay. Uh, before this exercise, we embarked on this exercise again. Uh, we had a good chat with the presidency, and I must say a big thank you to His Excellency, because I can say on authority that the uh, Office of Government Machinery and a few sensitive other things have paid their bills in full, as we speak. And uh, and so it's just it's just a routine exercise for the company to reduce its commercial losses. Yes, bar has been restored. They made uh, they made more than half of the payment to us, and uh, bar has been restored. And uh, we we agreed on a few other uh, modalities for the balance to be paid. If you've made a payment and it hasn't reflected, let's just say for argument sake, because this is something that you know the system or the situation we run. It could be put a positive comment or a negative comment by someone just to evade the whole payment process. Okay? If you make payment, there should be a receipt. Okay? If it hasn't reflected, where is the receipt? That's the first point of this is my receipt. I paid. Check the date. I don't see it here. And we can reconcile. But if you to, to tell me by word of mouth, I paid, it hasn't reflected. What is my reference point? And that indeed is the managing director of the electricity company of Ghana, Samuel Dobig Mahama, responding to what everybody uh, we've been waiting to hear, the reason for the recent power outages. And according to him, uh, it had more to do with maintenance setback and nothing to do with the fact that they are unable to procure crude oil to power the thermal plants. The reason why uh, ECG is unable to sustain uh, supply to your home. So if you slept in darkness yesterday, and maybe you are in darkness today. The assurance is that things will normalize. But is that the feeling you are getting? You can join us via our social media handles and tell us the, the situation as you have it in your hood. But let me let, let me let us explore the explanation provided by the, the electricity company of Ghana managing director Samuel Bahama. And Justice Kojo Yauche is with the African Center for Energy Policy. They've been watching this space very well. We'll also be speaking to uh, 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 Avin Gobet. Avin Gobet is uh, the Executive Secretary of the Importers and Exports Association of Ghana. They have some concerns regarding the development we have in the ECG catchment area. Uh, Justice, first let me pick your talks on this. Now yesterday we were told, I mean we were given a sequence of events from February 1 up to the end of February, the, the amount of load we've shared because we were unable to produce. Now the ECG managing director is insisting this afternoon that Dumso is not bad. The reason is was as a result of maintenance setback that was unplanned. Is that the same, you know, uh, 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 thing you are getting as to watch this space? Is that really what it's about? Uh, well, I think first of all, the sense we get is that Doomsaw is now a scary word mm. uh, that the managers of the system do not want to even hear. But the reality of the situation that we are facing is what uh, we've been talking about the, this week. If this were an isolated event where due to some emergency, uh, we had to uh, put power off mm. to ensure that we strengthen the system, then his explanations would be very welcome. Uh, just that uh, we would have wished that it had been communicated to consumers earlier so they could plan their activities. But you and I know that this problem 
is not a today problem. Mm. This problem is something that has been lingering uh, since somewhere September last year. Uh, we've had several episodes of power outages in the country. Uh, there are other uh, circumstances where there is power, but you can't do anything with the power uh, because it, the voltage is too low. Yes, and, uh, so and, 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 from where, that, and from where I live at North Legon, for, for, for almost a month now, that has been the trend, especially between uh, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. You, you, I mean, you have power, but you can't do anything with it. Yeah, I mean, we our office is also in North Legon, so we've had to be running our generators uh, for several weeks now, uh, incurring much more cost, even because of the uh, cost of uh, fuel that we have to incur. Mm. So it's it's not a today problem that he would come to offer uh, this explanation to us. I think that lack of candor uh, it also contributes to their inability to resolve the challenge. Because if you can really accept that this is the problem that we are facing, and these are the strategies that we have to undertake to resolve the problem, then you are not going to be able to get a handle on the problem. So and as an industry watcher, uh, what really is the problem? That we are not generating enough. I thought we, uh, I thought we, 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 we have been told several times that we have excess capacity. So you have, <laughs> you have, you, you have, your capacity is in excess, then we should be facing this challenge. I think, it's, I think uh, for some time now, nobody has mentioned excess capacity uh, because the plants that are available are generating power. Uh, so we've not had any uh, question of excess capacity. Mm. It's now the capacity that you have, is it dependable? Uh, are they able to generate power when you call on them to generate power? Uh, we know that there are some uh, problems with uh, fuel to generate the power. Uh, sometimes we have problems with the gas coming in from our trouble. Uh, but again, that is why we have contracted Nigeria Gas oh. to be able to complement that when we have uh, supply fluctuations. But because of the financial challenges in the sector, we are not even able to pay a uh, We are not able to pay NGAS to bring in the gas to us. Oh. I remember somewhere last month, uh, they had to threaten us uh, that they were going to shut the, the, the pipeline. They actually did uh, for the reverse flow oh. because we're not even paying the capacity charges to bring the gas from the west to the east. Uh, to produce uh, the, the the power for us. So, and the other plants that use liquid fuels as well, oh. uh, we've not been able to raise uh, the money to be able to purchase the fuel for them to produce the power. So this confluence of factors. So, 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 so maintenance, set, maintenance setback as, you know, alleged or as, as announced by the MD of ECG cannot be the main cause from where you sit. Oh. I mean, we have to interrogate this matter really well. I mean, this maintenance uh, issue. Every every now and then, when these episodes come, they said it's maintenance. I mean, what's the scale of the maintenance that is being done to the extent that the entire country? Because what I know is that for a power system, it is even possible to do maintenance without putting off the fire, uh, the power, oh. right? Um, and you don't do maintenance also across the whole country at the same time. Maintenance will probably be in phases. So if there's going to be some problem, then the problem is going to be in phases. But this looks like a widespread national problem oh. uh, that everybody is facing. So it cannot, it cannot be attributed uh, to uh, maintenance challenges that they have. Uh, just, as, just, just hold it there for me briefly, whilst I bring in the executive secretary, of the importers and exporters association when i come back to you i will want to find out the ecg has been on this revenue mobilization drive they are collecting their debts uh, their revenue has improved so why is it so difficult for them to pay for crude gas and the, 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 the other primary source of you know uh, uh, generate that, that they need to generate the power for us so uh, uh, uh samson i go back we spoke to one of your members how is this affecting the generality of the importers and exporters community? 
And if you can unmute for me, Samson Asakia Wingobet, the Executive Secretary of Importers and Sports Association of Ghana. Uh, okay. and, then, and then you so can tell can, me. Can, yes, can of course, I can me? hear you now. Please go ahead. Good. I, I said, let me correct this one impression. I don't think ECG doesn't uh, produce power. They do distribution. And so course, what yeah. it means is that ECG is an off ticker from the power producers. For example, the VRA, the Volta River Authority, produce and give to ECG lines, or I'm mean, Greco take it from them, from, uh, from uh, VRA, and then give it to their major customer, which is the ECG. And so ECG does the distribution to our home, to our offices and other things. And so if it's about power producing, I don't I think we should rather we, we are looking at the uh, end use and how and how the erratic power uh, is affecting your members. These agencies are all under the Ministry of Energy. And so ECG is also just an agency under the Ministry of Energy. Uh, but I'm happy that the ECG boss himself have spoken to your network and saying that it happened as a result of their system. I think at least I was on the Weasel TV this morning and they called my very good friend, Duncan, uh, Duncan Amoa from Kupek, and he also raised that it is a systemic problem, systemic failure. So it means that the ECG boss, uh, Dubik Mahama, has just come to confirm um, what uh, Duncan was raising this morning. And so as uh, our colleague from the ASAP is saying, uh, if it should be a system failure, uh, it, it should not be the whole country. And uh, it should, at least it should be some segment of the, some part of the, the country. But what we are experiencing now, I think that maybe we may probably need more and better particulars from the ECG boss to tell us more because his engineers will be reporting to him what actually happened. If it's not come from ECG, then it's come from elsewhere, then they need to let us understand. Uh, Yes, it, it, the, from what you are hearing from members from the business community, it is true because uh, assuming without admitting that you are running a, a cold store and you've closed for the day and you've gone home, uh, knowing that you have you plugged to the national grid, then you haven't made any provision to put up your uh, 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 generator and the whole power went off running to hours like 9 hours, to 10 or to 11 hours. What it means is that your product could, be, could run into unwholesome because even when you lift the container from the vessel, a ripper container, it's plucked in the vessel. And when you take it off from the vessel, you have to go straight to pluck it. And so if power outages okay at the port, then of course, those containers that are plucked at the port until you come to pick it to your cold store will also give you a wholesome product that you take to the market, and that will not be good for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so strongly, yes, last week, I think there was a crisis at the MPS uh, that, struck, that struck down some of their boom barrier were not opening, and a lot of things, containers that were due to, to transfer to outside terminals were not going, and even as of yesterday, there were still issues at, at the port. Because of and power so, issues? Of course, because of power issues? Yes, yes, of course. And so, uh, and so we cannot sit down and say all is well. I, but I'm happy that the MD himself is speaking now, and I'm sure he will have to uh, equip his uh, engineering department or uh, production department or distribution department to be up and doing so that at least uh, we will have powers in our home. If there is also a plan in sharing, not sharing, then indeed we are calling for it now so that it doesn't look like all the time we will we'll come back to the, the public and say that it is a systemic failure and, and not do so when uh, probably we are facing doom so. So I think that uh, I'm happy that in the morning, because one of the network called the PRO department of the ECG, but if this afternoon the MD himself is speaking, I think that is the right way to go. We hope that uh, ECG and the board will take this serious and all of us will have a play because nobody is happy to blame anybody. Uh, all what is happening is that this union was in parliament yesterday to 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 to, to block the, they block the whole parliament into into darkness, isn't it? Right. We all saw how many people were uh, remain in the lift somewhere at the chamber debating. I think my brother, uh, Honorable Abu Jinapo, was on his feet debating yesterday when the whole thing went off, and that wasn't the best way. Uh, I think it will be an embarrassment to the to the to to, to the state and to the country as well. But so I hope the government should be taking this thing serious to make mm -hmm. sure that they work on it. If it's about 
uh, bringing crude oil to power our generators. They have government, the, the finance minister, the acting finance minister, or the caretaker finance minister, which is my brother, uh, Honorable Amin Anta, who used to be with ISEP, you remember those days? Mm. As I hope he will listen to what ISEP are saying and release the money to ECG or to VRA and others, or to ECG to be able to pay. Because if ECG is taking power from the independent power producers mm. as well, and because they are not paying them what is due them, of course, they may produce the power and will not give ECG to distribute. And that could also cause the trigger that we are all facing at the moment. So all I right. strongly believe that uh, my brother, uh, the week if he's listened to us in good faith, we think that if we think that he owes the power distributors companies, uh, he should let all of us be aware so that we can all put pressure on the central government so that they will be able to pay him to be able to pay. Of course, I'm happy that yesterday his agency is out there raising revenue. That is a good way to go so that he can pay his debtors for right. those, those who owe them. And then they can also have reliable power for all of us to, to go. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Samson Asaki Aringobet. Uh, he's Executive Secretary of the Importers and Exporters Association of Ghana. Let me go back to justice as we look at the technical issues uh, relating to this very matter. Now, the, the, the bottom line, as you said, uh, you know, money, financing this particular sector is key if we are to get out of our current challenges. Now, ECG has in the past few months or few years They've embarked on, on an, an aggressive revenue mobilization. I mean, disconnecting state-owned enterprises that are owing them. Yesterday, Parliament suffered. They had to pay 10 million Ghana cities with the hope that uh, within this month of March, they will pay the rest of the 13 million Ghana cities. So if Parliament was not spared, it means that ECG is very bent on collecting every city in the system. Why is financing uh, the generation, why has it become so difficult for us to live up to our financial obligations. Are we not paying realistic tariff in the country? Uh, well, I mean, before I answer that, I think the earlier speaker uh, created the impression as if uh, I really do not understand how the power value chain is structured. I mean, the issues that I'm, I was speaking about are actually beyond ECG, right. looking at the entire power value chain. Now, to your question mm -hmm. on, on the revenue issues, yes, uh, we have seen since 2021, ECG has been going on uh, various campaigns in order to collect uh, more revenue from customers. Uh, tariff has also increased significantly. So the expectation is that uh, we are going to have um, a more fluid uh, power system that is able to pay for itself. Mm. But the challenge here is that the cash waterfall mechanism that we have worked with established to ensure that the money that is collected passes down along the value chain uh, is broken mm. because of two reasons. One, when ECG collects the revenue and is supposed to deposit into the cash waterfall mechanism account, it doesn't deposit all of the money that it collects into the account, right? So uh, recently, uh, I think this week, P PURC commissioned PWC uh, to do an audit of the various accounts of ECG. And they found discrepancies, millions of Ghana City discrepancies mm. between what is collected and what is deposited in the cash water form mechanism. And then there are also- And what is accounting for the discrepancies? Did, did, did they explain? Well, we are yet to hear from ECG on, on where the discrepancy is because they are supposed to take 25% of the revenues that accrue to the uh, cash water form mm -hmm. mechanism. So uh, there is their share, which is for their operating expenses. So if you take your share and there is still outstanding uh, monies that, that is due the system, then they have to come and answer. We've not had any answers from them. Okay. The second part is that there have been allocations also to non-cash waterfall mechanism beneficiaries. So there have been payments to entities that are not originally part of the cash waterfall mechanism. So these leakages from the cash for mechanism, cash waterfall mechanism, means that we will not have enough money to go around to pay the value chain. And that is where we are. So all the noise that we are having about we are collecting more revenue and all of that, the money is not going where it's supposed to be. And ECG has to 
uh, starts coming to account to us what the monies are being used for. Another, another, another reason provided by the MD of ECG this morning was the fact that people put up, I mean, the, the demand is, is, is growing. No doubt about that. People also put up structures and they don't go through the right channel and they connect to the national grid. And sometimes they are unable to tell. For example, we provided a channel where the plant there is operating at 100%. And that is resulting in power outages, uh, low, low, low current, and all those issues. As we progress, as more demand is made on ECG, are we doing enough investment in this sector? Since, let's say, for example, in the next five to 10 years, we're able to meet demand. Because clearly, from what we've been told, some of the machines, the contract period is almost ending. We need to renew with some of them. The lifespan is almost coming to an end. Have you really invested so much that in the next 10 years to come, will become self-sustaining in the energy sector? Right. That's in that problem of um, power theft is a challenge that ECG has been contending with uh, for several years. Mm. And I don't think it is the place of the ECG boss to now come and recount the story or the problem to us. They've been put there to fix the problem, mm -hmm. right? The tariffs that we pay, there is an allocation for the operations, maintenance, and investment for ECG as part of the tariffs that we paid. PRC approves every, every uh, major tariff review. So if we give you all of this money, you are not doing the investment as you should, then it's not us that you are coming to recount the, the story. To. I think what government has done over the years is to allow ECG to reform itself. And we've seen that it's not working. It's not working. At this point, really, we need an injection of genuine private capital, not the PDS uh, debacle that we have, uh, we've had in the past. Genuine capital and operational management of, of the company. If not, we'll still be facing this problem. Uh, they collect the revenues, like I've just shown you, they are paying to non-cash waterfall uh, mechanism entities. Um, so the investment is not being done. Uh, so um even the ones that is being done it is uh, the assumption is that when you invest in the system your losses will reduce but the losses are increasing so if the right investments are being done why are the losses uh, increasing those are challenges that we contend with and we expect that the system managers uh who we are paying tariff to who allocations have been made in the tariff for some of these things will be able to fix the problem but final question before I let you go, from what you heard from the ECG MD, are you confident that we'll see a normalization of the challenge beginning today from what you know as a watcher of this industry? No, I mean, to the extent that they are not able to accept the truth and the reality of what is happening, uh, I don't think that we'll have a handle on this situation anytime soon. Uh, it's something that's going to snowball. Very soon you hear the IPPs also come up, that if you don't pay us, we'll shut down mm. and all of those. We've not found a handle for the problem because the planners and the managers of the system are not being candid to us in really defining what the problem is and how we should address them. Uh, is it so necessary for them to come up with a load shedding timetable or based on what he said, it may not be necessary? No, they have to. They have to. They are shedding the load. People don't have power. So you have to. To the point, to the point where people do not have power or lights going off is just a misnomer. Uh, you have to share a, a, a timetable for us to plan our lives properly. All right. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon, Mr. Justice Yao Chef is with the Africa Center for Energy Policy. And as you heard from Parliament, the Energy Minister has been summoned to provide reasons why some parts of Ghana are constantly in darkness. The ECG says that things should normalize from today because what, what, we, what, we, what we have experienced in the last few days had to do more with maintenance setback that occurred one of their plans. And that situation has been fixed. And so going forward from today, we should have a normalization of the situation. This is the pause here on Joy News. We'll take a short break and we'll come back.
Hey, welcome back to the show. The pause here on Joy News. Now, the Ghana Statistical Service has revealed that a significant portion of the population aged 15 and 49, particularly in the rural areas, hold discriminatory attitudes towards individuals living with HIV. According to their recent study, nearly 8 in 10 females and 7 in 10 males who are aware of HIV harbor discriminatory beliefs. The prevalence of these attitudes is notably higher in rural communities compared to urban settings. On your screen now is a breakdown of the data by our research team as we have been looking at this matter. So over 70% of females and males between age 15 and 49 who have heard about HIV, according to the report by the Ghana Statistical Service, have discriminatory attitudes towards people living with HIV. And it goes on to say that discriminatory attitude is the inclination that children living with HIV should not attend school with children who are HIV negative or would not buy fresh vegetables from a, shoe, a shopkeeper who has HIV. And according to them, that's why the fact that we've come a long way in the increasing awareness about HIV. There's so uh, that issue of discrimination. So in terms of gender, uh, I said early on, eight in 10 females and males, seven in 10 females. So the issue of discrimination is very high and it's not coming down, at least between the age bracket of 15 and 49. This according to the Ghana Statistical Service. So uh, a discrimination attitude towards people with HIV decreases with wealth. The richer you are, the less discrimination you become. So when you are rich and you are HIV, you are accepted uh, according to the the research now persons with more education or are less likely to show discriminatory attitude towards people with hiv i don't know whether it's about the fact that they understand education they understand that it has become uh is that somebody suffering from any other ailment that's how come it varies with the person's level of education but very high with people who are lowly educated and so yeah so more from the Ghana statistical service on this matter. Now let's stay a little longer on health related issues because Tutu Nyoneta Jondis in the Guosu municipality of the Ahafo region has over the years presented down challenges to the municipal hospital due to the lack of an effective phototherapy machine. An improvised phototherapy device otherwise known as Firefly built with a wooden framework and three defective UV bulbs is hampering treatments as babies take longer periods under the machine. An NGO, Redeeming Hands Foundation, has provided the hospital with its first ever Firefly phototherapy machine to ease the burden and facilitate quicker treatment of neonatal jaundice. There's more in this report. From 2015 to 2019, Ghana witnessed a concerning escalation in neonatal jaundice cases, with reported numbers rising from 3,031 to 9,273. Neonatal jaundice emerged as the third highest cause of admission for newborns at the Confanoti Teaching Hospital. Here at the Gorsu Municipal Hospital, an improvised machine was made to treat the condition to avoid referral to other centers outside the region. Unlike the wooden improvised machine, the phototherapy firefly machine works faster to decrease the amount of jaundice in the blood. Irene Adofua Entry is head of neonatal intensive care units at the hospital. We are using balls, the blue balls, um, attached to a wooden table. So that is what we are using for now. That's what we use to manage it. It's working, but this is the situation. We don't know how um, the, the rays of uh, the light waves that we are giving to the baby, maybe if a baby is supposed to be under the photo for about 20, maybe 48 um, hours, the baby can go maybe about almost a week before the jaundice will resolve after we have done our investigation. So with the proper equipment, we know that our outcomes of jaundice will be far better this time. In 2022, the cost of the Firefly phototherapy machine was 27,500 Ghana cities, but it is currently sold at 62,000 Ghana cities. Director for Redeeming Hands Foundation, Wendy Boatma Ofori, is prevailing on the government to make provisions for hospitals to afford the machines to curb neonatal complications in babies. I 
think they are not in tune with how the complications that come with untreated neonatal jaundice. There are no provisions made for the hospitals to afford these kinds of machines. I think people in like opinion leaders and people in positions should take this up because some of the kids are ending up with cerebral palsy, some are like ending up losing their hearing and all that. All those things can be curbed if there was an available phototherapy machine. I mean, if you're a mother, or you've had a child who has suffered neonatal jaundice, you know the effects, the toll it has on the mother, the toll it has on the, you know, the uh, care providers and everything. We are pleading with them to come on board, join us campaign, make noise in court about this phototherapy machine, tell people opinion leaders, let people in positions know how neonatal jaundice is affecting babies, how important this machine is in treating and preventing some of these complications that these babies suffer. Those of you that can help us, we plead with you to come on board. We raised most of this money off social media. Redeeming Hands Foundation educated nurses and midwives at the Gorsu Municipal Hospital on neonatal jaundice and also donated a firefly machine to curb the disease. The machine is the first to be donated in the Ahafu region. I need to sell Ajika's reports read to you. Also, the Ministry of Sanitation and Water Resources are joined calls for an action plan and constitutional amendment to help eradicate gender-based violence, especially against women and children. Such acts have become predominant in rural areas where women and children lack basic needs, including water, schools, and toilet facilities. The ministry joined a stakeholder engagement in Kumasi address issues of gender-based violence and sexual exploitation to develop an action plan to eradicate such acts whilst ensuring the arrest of perpetrators. There's more in this report as well. In Ghana, women face an increased risk of sexual violence, according to a report on domestic violence by the Institute of Development Studies 2016. An important feature of such incidents is the nature of the power relations created by parties, perpetrators and victims of this practice and the context that draws them together. This has necessitated an action plan by the Ministry of Sanitation and Water Resources to subdue such offences to facilitate inclusive delivery of water and sanitation services. Justice Gloria Mensabunsu is in charge of the gender-based violence court at the Kumasi High Court. She underscores the need for an action plan and a constitutional amendment to curb such acts. The law is that if there is an established defilement, the punishment, the minimum punishment is seven years imprisonment and the maximum is 25 years imprisonment and it's a strict liability law. So there's no option of a fine. Therefore, why, why would we come to court for somebody to be sent to prison whilst we get nothing out of it? So they think that if, to me, I think that looking at the cases so far, and the challenges I have in prosecuting them, if the law is amended so that we have an option of a final compensation, not even that option standing alone, but in addition to um, a term of imprisonment. Justice Mensa Bonsu encouraged parents to report cases of GBV, sexual exploitation and sexual harassment to ensure perpetrators are brought to book. Yeah. I advise parents, you know, and I sympathize with them because I know that because of stigmatization and all that, it's very difficult. But when it happens, it has happened, and it has a long term trauma effect on your child. Long term, because right now you may not know. But the person may not want to be married or will have issues relating very well with the partner. So they should try as much as possible to allow the law to take its course so that the perpetrators will be brought to book. Project lead for the ministry explained why it is putting up an action plan against the gender-based violence and its related offences. One of the indicators that we are looking now is gender inclusivity, leaving no one behind principles and all that. And once you are bringing both women, men, girls, boys into development contest, there are some populations that are vulnerable to gender-based violence and then sexual exploitation. So for us providing service in water and sanitation, and we work in communities, 
of course we'll have those vulnerable people in our working environment we need to put a system in place for us to be able to achieve that target of redress of any gender-based violence for joe news my name is nana boache danko yadom kumasi let's still stay in the ashanti regional capital because the ashanti hene otum voice to the second has stored some project size of health facilities in the ashanti region which are either stored or under construction Prominent among the facilities he visited is the Sewa Regional Hospital, which is about 90% complete, but left unattended with deplorable road impeding its usage. The Asantikina inspected the pace of work at the project site whilst advocating for their early completion. Nana Bwachi Adam joined the tour and has come to with this report. Santee invested three project sites in the Ashanti region, including the ongoing renovation works he speared in at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital, the stalled Sewa Regional Hospital, and the mother and baby unit at the Menshe Hospital. The comprehensive renovation and modernization of the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital has reached a 60% completion rate. Utunfo has been leading the Hillcath project through a $10 million public fundraising exercise to renovate the traditional wards of the hospital. Samo Edubwache is the chairman of the Hillcath project. Konfanochi is not going to uh, leak any further when it rains. One of the major problems of Konfanochi was the fact that if it rained today for two weeks, some of the wards will be leaking. We are privileged and happy to mention that the last rains that we have experienced, not even one leakage. The king is very pleased. The progress of work so far, because of the space uh, concerns, the hospital is still in session. So what is happening is that we'll be doing it in phases. So currently, the A4, A5 demolition has happened. The things have almost arrived. So as it arrives, we'll be making sure that just a matter of fixing those uh, fixtures and fittings that we have imported to be able to do this. The Asante Hini later inspected the Siwa Hospital project, which is to serve as a regional hospital. The facility, already 90% complete, is left unattended with deplorable roads, impeding its usage. Dr. Emmanuel Tinkrain is the Ashanti Regional Health Director. The hospital has been completed for the past one year. What we need to do is to get electricity connected to the hospital. You know, the, we need a transformer that can power all the machines. And the current electricity that we have will not be enough to power the machines. That's, uh, that's the reason why we believe that we need a new machine. So fortunately, ECG uh, has connected us from the main line and given us two transformers. All that we need to do now is to connect the hospital to the main lines. And then we can test run the machines and then train the staff and then open the facility. Mm. Also the road, uh, you saw it yourself. We need to put it in shape. Dr. Ejaku Poku, who spoke on behalf of the Asantene, says the visit is to advocate for the completion of the projects. It is part of his activity to occasionally go around to see the developmental activities going on. Sewia so Regional Hospital is very significant and he must come and see. I have been told that it's about 90% completed. So he's here to find out why it's not moving and to see how he can't also support the program to go. Definitely he will have to uh, put in his advocacy skills to get us move. The Asante Hini ended his inspection at the construction of the baby and mother unit at the Minshia Hospital. Well, the Asante Hini is expected to add up his voice and call on government to speed up its work on these sites to ensure that these projects are completed in no time. For Joy News, my name is Nana Bwachidankwa Yado. Kumase. This is a pause here on Joy News. Now, the importance of hearing and its impact on our daily lives cannot be overstated. Hearing is a vital sense that allows us to communicate, learn, and connect with others. It plays a crucial role in our overall well-being and quality of life. This year's World Hearing Day themed Hearing Care for All emphasizes the need for accessible and affordable hearing care services for everyone, regardless of age or income level. The University of Ghana Medical Center is raising awareness about the importance of early detection and intervention in preventing hearing loss. Abiba Sumaila 
a set of the audiology units at the University of Ghana Medical Center. And uh, she joins me for more. Uh, Abiba, good afternoon. Welcome to the polls. Hi, good afternoon. And it's good to have you. So uh, how important is this aspect of human life? Well, um, most of the times people don't really pay attention to what affects our ears. Mm. Um, because uh, when people have hearing loss, it doesn't really um, call for any sympathy and we don't really see their disability. So we don't see the kind of struggles they go through in their daily lives. So um, World Hearing Day is actually a day set aside by World Health Organization to create awareness about ear and hearing related issues. All right. And this year is actually not an exception. Mm. And the theme this year's celebration is um, changing mindsets, making ear and hearing care a reality for all. And in all these things, World Health Organization has provided a policy document mm. that will address the perception people have about hearing loss. And because um, in this part of our world, people have so many myths and religious beliefs about hearing related issues. Some ascribe it to be Cases, some right. things that it, um, I, hello? Yeah, I, yes, I, I was just emphasizing the point that what you're talking about, some even attributed to spiritual issues, demonic issues, and exactly. you know. Mm -hmm. So we want to actually use this opportunity to um, tell the whole world, especially people in Ghana, that um, hearing loss is actually medical. All right, there are some um, genetic causes, there are some um, infections that can also um, cause hearing loss. And in some cases, too, people expose their noise to noise. Mm. Prolonged exposure to noise can actually give you a hearing loss. All right, so UGMC, University of Ghana Medical Center, is joining the rest of the world to celebrate this day. And as part of our celebration, we also want to have a stakeholder engagement. In that, we have heads of institution from other hospitals like Achimota Hospital, Medina Polyclinic, among others, mm. just to come on board to have this stakeholder engagement to discuss the way forward so far as ear and hearing care related issues are concerned in Ghana. So when you look at the policy about hearing issues in Ghana, mm -hmm. so I mean, nothing has actually been done about it. Um, there are few hospitals in Ghana who can actually work on hearing related issues. And I think that is not really fair. So we want to use this opportunity to draw the attention of the government. We want to use this opportunity to draw attention of the stakeholders, the media, mm -hmm. to come on board so that we can all together work and help the people with hearing and um, ear-related issues. You, you, and, um, you, yes, you, you work in a hospital. I just want to find out how prevalent are hearing-related issues in a hospital. Do you get more cases, and what and what what bring about these cases? Yeah. So for us in the hospital, you know, um, we are confronted with so much um, challenge because I mean there are limited um, professionals when it comes to these areas mm. and. So um, there are so many of these hospitals across Ghana who do not even have the equipment to screen these um, hearing-related issues, all right? So it becomes really a challenge to ascertain the uh, prevalence among Ghanaians. Mm. However, there have been a couple of research done in this regard, especially from students of the uh, University of Ghana who, who took their master's um, in audiology program. So there are some prevalence, especially among people with TB, children with cleft palates. I mean, there are so many research done in this area. Mm. But to attain the prevalence across Ghana, um, I must say that the number is uh, quite significant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of these things goes unreported because most of these hospitals don't have the professionals to screen this issue. So you realize that these children are found in schools and they'll be struggling. And most of the situations will go unnoticed until it actually becomes worse. Mm. So, 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 for example... Uh, I mean, the, the people you attend to, are they grown-ups or children? And, I mean, how did they come up with these, you know, complications? Well, so for some of the causes of hearing-related issues can be prenatal causes, all right? So for the prenatal causes, it comes from conception, mm. all right? So from conception, you find out that um, some mother may have some uh, some complications while they are pregnant all right and this complication may be through 
infections that they had, like rubella, can actually affect the hearing of the child. And sometimes to perinatal causes like prolonged labor, birth asphyxia, all right, all these things are things that can really affect um, babies. And for some children too, they may have infections, ear infections, all right? And some of these infections, if they are not treated, obviously are going to affect the hearing of the children. So as part of the intervention and as part of the awareness creation, UGMC has on board so many professionals across the districts, mm. all right? So we want to bring all of them on board. We are going to have, uh, we are expecting actually, uh, Honorable Bernardo Coboy and the Presidential Advisor on Health. So we are expecting uh, Dr. Nsiasari to be there because we have um, some presentations around the genetic cause of hearing loss um, preschool hearing and early detection of hearing loss. So these are some of the topics we are going to discuss and we have a lot of professionals like the midwives who have direct contact with children right. once they are born. Mm. We are also expecting nurses to be around because they help the mothers through their antenatal period. So this is a way to create awareness and to have a direction as a country on how to go and how to handle issues like this. Can hearing impairment, can it be cured? And uh, can, well, can, can one have full restoration? Okay, so for the hearing uh, hearing impairments, there are actually three forms of it, all right? So we can look at the conductive causes. So the conductive causes could be uh, maybe if somebody has a wax impacted on the ear, mm. in the ear, sorry. So the wax can actually cause a temporal hearing loss, all right? So once the wax is washed out, the person will be okay. For some people, it's an infection. So once it's treated by the ENT, obviously that one too will be taken care of. But for the hearing loss, that affects the sensory organ of the ear, which is the cochlea. Most of it could not be, um, how do you call it? Um, be, be, um, be restored. Restored, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, we have other rehabilitation um, um, strategies we can adopt, such as the use of hearing aids, we have FM systems. So these are all strategies. In fact, now we have advanced to the point that we have cochlear implants. Mm. So all these things could be done as intervention to help people with hearing loss. Right. So and also mm -hmm. yeah. other strategies like mm -hmm. sign language. Mm -hmm. All right. That's why you can have people with um, hearing impairments who use sign language as a medium of communication. So people who use all, man all manner of things to clean their ears, are they in any danger? I wear a watch. That tells me when I've been in an environment that the sound level is above the, the accepted level. And it tells me to move away from it. So sound can also create an environment for uh, this thing to happen. But for those who use all manner of things to clean their ears, are they in any danger of, you know, hurting their, 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 hearing, their hearing faculties? Exactly, exactly. Because um, one thing about the ear is that the ear is self-cleansing. It does the business of cleaning itself, mm -hmm. all right? As you chew. I mean, the wax are pushed out once you chew because you know the jaw, uh, the ear sits on the jaw, right. all right? So you move your mouth. The ear pushes the wax away, out. I mean, when you sleep, some of the wax can fall off. When you are bathing, some of the water can get into your ear and dissolve the, the wax. Mm. So you don't really have to put anything in your ear. Essentially, when you put this cotton swab in the ear, what you are doing is to rather push the wax inside, all right? And when it goes in, you are also reducing the moisture in the wax, and it makes the wax very hard, all right? Mm. And sometimes it gets impacted unless you see an ENT professional to get it washed out. And unfortunately for people who also use these things, if you don't take care, you may even rupture your tympanic membrane, which is your eardrum, mm. all right? So for me, I don't think it's advisable to actually put anything in your ear because the ear actually does the business of cleaning itself. All right. So, so if it is mm. too much or excessive, just walk in UGMC or any other ENT facility and have your ear washed for you. But just like health professionals recommend periodic medical checkup, would you say that perhaps I should find time to visit the hospital once in a while to have my ears checked? Exactly, exactly. Especially when you notice certain signs, all right? Certain signs like you need to ask people to um, repeat what they told, uh, they, they told you. Mm -hmm. Or when you constantly ask people to repeat themselves. Or when you have to increase the volume of TV set constantly. 
all right? And when you find out that anytime you're on a phone, phone call, it's very difficult for you to hear whatever they are saying, mm. all right? These are all signs that should tell you that, no, there's a need for me to visit an ENT specialist. Some people may have ear discharge. So once you see some of this discharge, obviously you think that there's a problem. When mm. you have pain, when you feel like there's fullness in the ear, all right, all these things are signs to tell you that, hey, there's a problem with me and I need to see a, a ear specialist. So when is the program happening? All right, so the program is on the 4th of March. So what we are in there is on the 3rd. But because it's a Sunday, so we will have a seminar and a stakeholder engagement on Monday at UGMC, University of Ghana Medical Center. Are you opening a door for, for everyone to attend? Exactly, exactly. The door is open for everybody who wants to learn and contribute to this discussion. So oh. I encourage everybody to join us. Oh, well, thank you very much for your time this afternoon, Habiba. Uh, we'll be there to thank listen you. to the expert advice on hearing. This is a pause. We'll take a short break and come back. And you welcome back to the show. Now, in the wake of the increasing economic difficulties, including unemployment in the country, the Ghana Scholarly Society is expressing worry and gathering experience brings in an attempt to help address the situation. The society consists of Ghanaian citizens and people of Ghanaian heritage living in abroad and working within the fields of academia, science, or studying at the postgraduate research level, aims at a Spanish scholarly network and influence policy decision, the educational offering and curricular development through impactful research. Now, let me bring in President of the Ghana Scholarly Society, Professor Kwaku Adams, for this conversation. Professor Adams, you're welcome to the post. Thank you for having me. So what is, what is this project all about? I'm, I'm sure you, you have heard the saying, two heads are better than one. Right. I, I disagree with that. I think <laughs> two good heads are better than one. When you have people doing interesting things, multidisciplinary research, when we bring those ideas together, that's when we can find a clear pathway to solving the problems that we face because the problems we face in Africa are diverse and complex. So we need diverse and complex ideas to be able to solve them. So this is about research, if you like. Well, it's about research. It's about tackling issues of unemployment. It's about uh, looking at the legal system in, in Africa, in Ghana. It's about looking at gender diversity. It's about looking at inequality. So it's a wide range of issues that we tackle. It's not just one scholar. It's all the Ghanaian scholars, mm -hmm. particularly in Europe, that we've put ourselves together to look at the challenges we face as, as a country and think through what we can do to contribute to our quota, to solving some of the challenges that Ghana faces. So let me provide you with some facts so that they can help in our discussion. So the Ghana Statistical Service last month released the, the, the unemployment situation in the country as at the end of the last, last quarter of 2023 and gave a very grim picture of the unemployment status, especially between the ages of uh, 15 and 49, which is considered to be the most active age back in terms of working. Now, mo about almost 2 million of them are at home and unemployed. Now, we also do understand that every year, universities in Ghana, you know, graduate over 200, between 200 and 300,000 graduates and then push them onto the job market. Few of them get employed. The issue is that, and reasons that have been provided include the fact that our economy is simply not in a position to absorb all of them into the labor uh, market. Is that the same vibe you get? Or there's more to our unemployment situation than what we've been told by the statistical service and the, the, the policy makers? I will give you uh, three words, three letters. MAP, MAP. <laughs> if, if people start businesses mm -hmm. and they fail, and things don't go the way they're supposed to go, it's because of mentoring. Mm. Mentoring is not right then the, um, the access to relevant resources and also the process, or maybe let's say even the attitude mm. is not right. So I think what the British Council have started to do is to provide skills training for the youth, for those who want to set up their own businesses. And we have had meetings with the British Council mm. here in the UK, where we are going to be doing quarterly 
because we've got experts in entrepreneurship, experts in finance, in accounting, mm. in international business, in all kinds of expertise that we can contribute. So we are going to work in collaboration with the British Council to look at the skills gaps, basically filling in the skills gaps. What are the uh, critical things that entrepreneurs need to succeed, to set out, to mm. keep a business running, to recruit people, to retain them, and to make, make a success of it? These are the gaps that we find that uh, the young entrepreneurs do lack. Mm -hmm. So we will be working with the British Council. I think it's going to be a quarterly program or annual program. Our scholars are going to be flown to Ghana to be supporting and doing seminars and sessions and lectures to provide the skills that entrepreneurs and young people need to be able to succeed in Ghana. The, the, the other aspect, and then we, we've heard this a lot, that we are, we, we've not designed the kind of uh, courses that best address industry's needs. But is it a question of, you know, graduating people to be employed, sit behind a desk and work, or graduating people to, to provide them with the skills so that they can be on their own and flourish? That's a very good question. Um, what do you look at? Um, I've been in the UK for 21 years now. Um, when you get to the, when we get students from Africa or, or any other developing country, mm. one of the things that we lack, what our very training is very much theoretical, is the, it's number one, critical thinking mm. and the practical application of that knowledge. So when, when we join forces with the British Council to do these things, we will look at some of the practical things that people need, uh, entrepreneurs need, young people need. It's just basic skills. I mean, having the head knowledge is good. How do you apply those knowledge? And I'm sure you know that the British education system and all others in the West, or pretty much OECD countries, is very much hands-on. Mm. Now I've taught in the UK education system for 17 years now, and others have done even more years than I, I have done. So bringing all that expertise in, in terms of accounting, uh, bookkeeping, finance, how do you set up a business? What are the factors that uh, makes businesses succeed? Mm. What are the key resources that firms need to succeed? You know, in typical A-level economics, we're taught land, labor, capital, enterprise. But information is a key resource. Reputation mm. is a key resource. Location is a key resource. These are new trends in terms of research that we don't get to hear of them in the African, in the African curriculum or in the mm. African classrooms. And that's what we intend to bring down to, to Ghana's support. Not in any way discounting what the great work that our colleagues back in Ghana are doing. I mean, I mean give me your, your, your candid view on this matter. The future prospects of a Ghanaian graduate and the future prospects of, let's say, a graduate from a UK or a US university, in terms of succeeding in life, what is so difficult for the Ghanaian graduate to aspire to that high level? Yet it's very easy, as we see in the UK and in the US. Well, two things. One, individuals have got a part to play in the uh, quest to succeed or to start a business. So the individual, there's an individual factor. We cannot blame all of it on the teaching or the modules. But you will agree with me, definitely, that the curriculum that we have in, in Ghana, the universities, the polytechnics, the technical uh, education system has not delivered in terms of the current needs of the market. If you look at the British education system, um, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a huge manufacturing sector in the Midlands. They provided a tr training, technical training to support people to be able to function effectively in those sectors. Now, Look at Ghana. What are the industries that are succeeding? What are the sectors that are growing? We need to change our approach, what we teach, how we assess, what we expect students to be able to do for us to, to decide that these students have acquired enough skills and expertise to be able to function on their own. We need to look at the industries and de redesign our curriculum to suit the current needs of the Ghanaian, of the Ghanaian market. So basically, most of the things we teach in classrooms nowadays um, are outdated and has no semblance to some of the growing sectors in the Ghanaian economy. We need to match that so that there is no mismatch. We train students by the time they finish, their skills are no longer useful. We need to be able to research. And, and one of the things that the Ghanaian government needs to do is provide research for our colleagues who work in various universities to research 
into the most emerging sectors in, in, in Ghana. What are the growing sectors? You know, we need to be able to match that with the curriculum. That's something that I think we have not been able to do very well as, as Africans, not just in Ghana, but Africa mm. in general. So, Dr. Adam, finally, before I let you go, when is this program starting and who benefits? So, well, as a society, we've started a society. We have uh, over 200 uh, academics in the UK, and, and we want to draw it to other parts of the world. But we are starting off a conference in June, uh, June 19th to 21st, and it's a multidisciplinary conference. It's focused on the UN SDGs. And we are taking an interdisciplinary approach, those in accounting, those in finance, those in law, in social, you know, so, social development, social work, bringing the expertise together for us, discuss some of mm -hmm. the pressing issues that faces Ghana and Africa. How do we solve them? It is going to be the best conference that, uh, that brings together all Africa, all, all African scholars together discussing uh, specific issues using multidisciplinary knowledge bases to solve some of the challenges we face in Africa. It's going to happen at the University of Bradford from mm. June um, June 19 to 21st. And there is a, we have our website available. So those who want to participate in the conference should submit their two-page extended abstract or full papers if they want. Mm. And the deadline is end of this month, end of March. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Kweku Adams with the Ghana Scholarly Society. And what they're doing is to empower you to be on your own. You don't have to rely on somebody to employ when you do university. But this mentorship program is what you require to go forward. Now, we'll take a, a, a minute before we return. The majority leader in Ghana's parliament is my guest on the force. So the conversation you've been waiting for now, when the rule was called on January 7th, 2013, 35-year-old Alexander Kwame Afenyawakin took his seat to represent the people of Ifitu in the central region in the seas parliament of Ghana. His background in financial law got him a seat on the famous finance as well as the defense and interior committees of parliament. In his 11 years as a legislator, he helped shape various bills, introduce amendments, fought and won several cases at the Supreme Court when the constitution of Ghana was in danger of being breached. He was appointed deputy majority leader in the eighth parliament and will lead to the end to it will lead to end the life of this parliament as the majority leader and leader of the house now today i'm privileged to have alexander federal Markin, the man who started life as a principal poster officer at the ghana post company limited to the Futu municipal assembly as assembly member for kojo bedu electoral area a later presiding member in his 20s former board chair of the ghana water company and now at age 46 Lee's Ghana's parliament as a majority leader. Unless you welcome. Thank you, Alton. It is a pleasure to have you here. Oh, my dear. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Mm. Let me let our viewers know that you are part of those who nurtured me mm. in parliament, and I appreciate all that you did mm. in my early days in the house. We were such a great uh, journalist. Mm. You and uh, Richard Sky and uh, our brother, Lister Wafodjo, mm. your combined who, who, effects. Who, who is now a lawyer? Yes, indeed. Your combined effect mm. made a positive impact. Mm. So thank you to Multimedia for bringing you to Parliament and for making some of us better politicians. Mm. I appreciate that a lot, and I want to say that for the records. Thank you, Elton. I appreciate your kind words. Awesome brother. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so this week you've been, you, you, you've been talking and making the point, I mean, after uh, your, your, your ascension to the, to the role of majority leader. I mean, did you see it coming? Well, I did not. Mm. Like I said in my opening speech, um, MPP is a big party mm. with a lot of talent, a lot of professionals, great minds, and even if you dream to uh, do something, you can only rely on, on the grace of God. Mm. So I think divinity and the cosmic masters themselves uh, conspired positively mm -hmm. in my favor. And I'm mm -hmm. grateful to the Lord God Almighty, great architect of the universe, for those favors received. Um, you remember that in opposition, we worked so hard. Right. And when we had 
the opportunity to be in government. I lost out in government. Mm. Uh, no appointment in the executive and at, at, uh, in parliament, even committees, I was not in leadership. Mm. And here we were, uh, some of our new entrants were getting cabinet jobs. Some new entrants were my seniors at committee. Mm -hmm. And I was a uh, Bob No Rank. <laughs> I was sent to ECOWAS Parliament. There too, there was a whole bruhaha. Yeah, you had to, resign. You had to step down step for somebody down else to, to take over Ghana the position. To be sworn in because we were nine instead of eight. Mm. Because there was an internal uh, crisis that mm. had its own carry, yeah. carry forward there. And I came back home and so dejected, so depressed. And my good friend uh, and uncle, or da and dad and senior brother Kennedy Japan, mm -hmm. saw me at the car park. You know, say, hey, what's wrong with you? Take it easy. This is life. And drove me to his house, what we call the midnight tea, <laughs> which code I have today decoded. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sat together. We spoke to me up to 2 a.m. and made an offer that, look, I know you have your businesses down. If you want to revive some of your businesses, I have some good capital for you. Mm. And then as you make your profit, you pay me back. I'll give you that offer. Forget about the political job and focus on that. So that was how it started. I had to focus on my business, my law practice, and chamber work. But, 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 but I know, for example, that even before you, you went into politics, you were a very successful businessman. Yeah, I was running Boxite. Boxite, I, I was a courier a, service, courier service. Your, your we're law doing, firm. We were doing Ghana Boxite. I was doing uh, Boxite uh, uh, shipment from Awasu to Takrad and mm. I was doing manganese. Uh, for Bauxite, I was the main uh, transport and service provider. You were in your 20s even yeah. at that time. I remember I went to Epany in France to buy trailers. And uh, the, the, the manufacturer asked me whether I was uh, managing my father's business and I, whether I was... Well, whether you came with your father. Uh, whether <laughs> I, was, I was a hair apparent. And I said, no, that's my business. And, you know... They were shocked. It's still the grace of God. And we were doing working for Ghana magazines. And then also uh, when these Indians came with uh, diamond cement, mm -hmm. we worked, we were hauling for their limestone for them from Tablibo in Togo mm. to Aplao, and then from Aplao to Bupe. And then from, we were taking their clinker from Takrade to Bupe and then doing uh, Aplao to Takrade. You know, it was such an experience where you have to be trailing your drivers, following them. That time, we didn't have tracking device. Mm. So everything was manual. You had to and do it yourself. We had to. And the business took a nose because of politics? Uh, partially. I mean, because when I got into politics, I remember when I got elected as an assemblyman and subsequently becoming a presiding member, Standard Chartered Bank had given me some $4 million facility and they had bought some trucks for me. Mm. So I think one morning, uh, one of their officers said he saw my poster, mm -hmm. you know, my poster on one of the... The trucks. The, no, no, one of the, uh, the, the buses at mm -hmm. Kanishi, mm -hmm. the Winneba Accra buses. Mm -hmm. It had my poster, you know, and then he took uh, a picture and sent it to the office. So I remember at the time they said I was a politically exposed person because we have given you a loan and you are also doing politics. So it was Alex Mould mm -hmm. who intervened because the meetings were held in Alex's office. He was the head of uh, the department and some guys were pushing that they should uh, call in the facility. Mm -hmm. So I remember Alex Mould would invite me, say, young man, why don't you stop the assembly? I said, ah, but it doesn't have any effect on my business. I'm running the business, I'm paying my facility. Eventually, I was not successful. Mm -hmm. They downgraded my account to GSA. You know, in Stan Chat mm -hmm. then, I don't know whether it's there now, mm -hmm. if your account is, uh, is, uh, is in distress, mm -hmm. they now downgrade you to a different department. Mm -hmm. So you are no more part of the corporate stream. Right. So a different department will manage you where you have to give an account of every expenditure. So when your revenue comes, you need to justify why they should give you this mm -hmm. money. But that situation rather got worse. Mm -hmm. And... Some of, I remember Mele Newman did very well. Mele, you know, thank you, Mele. She did so well, was managing me and Estelle and Cole. We were having 
back and forth. Then right. eventually, the group head for West Africa, Buba Jene, you know, said, look, young man, we'll try and help you, but mm -hmm. pay your facility. So we're on and on and on until the trucks uh, give up. And I think when I eventually got elected as a member of parliament, you know these drivers? Right. There's this Ghanaian attitude towards uh, business, employment. They, they really don't care, you know, and uh, they mess it up. But be it as it may, we are here. And mm -hmm. I think I was also hauling for Guinness, mm -hmm. my flat bed. Mm -hmm. I was a major transporter for Guinness Ghana Limited, you know. So when I became an MP, you know, drivers would go and they would park the truck somewhere, steal some of the drinks. <laughs> and then when you come, Guinness, when they are paying you, they deduct it. All, all those things. Right? I saw. So, so yeah. We're losing money. And then these uh, Chinese people who do a uh, holiday, import uh, tiles and mm -hmm. all that, we're hauling for them in Tema to mm -hmm. their Malam office. You know, I've forgotten their name. Mm -hmm. You know, they have an office at Malam, so the warehouse there. So we got over 200 trucks, yes. And I think Intercontinental also bought some trucks for me, NIB bought some trucks. But in all of these, one person that I must mention, Mr. Amwabi, you know, he... Formerly of UT Bank. UT Bank, yes. You know, we did some business with UT, Logist, uh, UT Financial Services. And Mr. Amwabi was a true father to me. He understood my situation. He called me one day to ask me a lot of questions. He said, why do you like politics? You know, he speaks funny mm -hmm. with me. And I answered, he looked at me, say, you this young man, you are brave. Anyway, when I was in distress, he said, look, I won't take you to court but I'll give you the chance to pay, mm -hmm. put in place some measures. And then they appointed uh, an auditor to manager, look at your books. Yes, to look at mm -hmm. us and we work together. You know, I've had a fair share of life's crisis. Mm -hmm. I've learned a lot. I've made some very silly mistakes, terrible mistakes, because in life, if you don't start with a mentor, you don't have a godfather, and you, everything is on your own, so, 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 you're likely so, to make a lot of mistakes. So, 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 so because you, I didn't have one, so you think, I, I suffered a lot. So, so you think you're calling this business or politics because clearly you you seem to be, you were doing very well in business yes. before you ventured into yes. politics and made good money mm -hmm. made good money all right um i think what even took me to the law school was an accident i had at uh, uh la palm mm -hmm. you know i was driving in my mercedes you know on the on the on the la, la road and a woman crossed me and then while she was apologizing two little kids in her car one, I presume, was eight, the other ten. And while their mom was pleading, one said, hey, if you don't uh, stop what you're saying. Mm -hmm. No, no. I was insisting mm -hmm. that the woman should fix my car. Okay. It's a Mercedes, you know, a young man in my early 20s. Because she caused the accident. She caused, yeah, she crossed me. She did a U-turn, you mm -hmm. know, from the... Oh, she was driving. Yeah, she was driving. Okay. When did you do you? Mm -hmm. She was coming from the trade fair, yeah. like the regiment, well, that U-turn mm -hmm. that used to be there. And then one, the one of the girls said, our uncle is a lawyer. So if it goes to court, you lose. And the other one said, our grandmother is a judge. I was heartbroken. So the, the, the case had been decided there. I, I was heartbroken. And I realized that life was not all about money. So I just drove off, got to uh, my residence. I mean, wept a bit. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, at that time, I had left Kivaz and abandoned school. And I was doing business. Mm -hmm. So I said, I need to go to school. All right? And, and, that's, then, how you, and that's how you... That's where I applied. Then I got back to Buckingham and then... I said, I will do law, you know. And also, when you're a businessman, you walk around, people don't respect you. They think that you are rich, you are not wise, you are not smart. You know, a lot of businessmen mm. who are not too educated are looked down upon. So it's like, ah, when you scar, you know, say when you scar, and I want to school. So that thing also hit me hard. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I will. You, you, but for the politics itself, I don't think I had planned my life around politics. Mm -hmm. It was my classmates who accosted me when I was in final year. And then at that time, I think uh, Yamo Kufo was a candidate in Winneba MPP, and he had stepped down. And then it was a Friday or so. I was preparing to fly to UK, you know, final year. Mm. And then they came and said, ah, you know, all our colleagues are saying you should stand. The polling station chairman called us that. At that time, I was a financial And, and this was the parliamentary prime minister? Yes. Okay. The 2041. Mm -hmm. So... They stopped me from going, and I followed through. And uh, eventually, when all was cooked, mm -hmm. the elders of Winneba said, you are too young, you are a small boy, you can't be... You can't uh, represent us in parliament. And we settled the matter in, uh, in, in, in Kufo's office at the castle. Mm -hmm. 
And I think Kufu had almost judged the thing for me. And one elderly man said, Mr. President, only a school. Because the president was addressing me, lawyer. Then he asked, he said, ah, so you are not done with school? I said, yes. How do you come to parliament and, and, then, go, and to UK, still go to school? And you are not even studying in Ghana. So no, 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 no. Go and finish your school. I wept bitterly. I was on the floor rolling, crying, and, you know, all mm. manner of things. Then later I was asked by an elderly person, Mr. Yebi Yangs, the former chairman of the party, to uh, participate in assembly elections. Uh, that was in the 206 elections. Mm -hmm. And that one, too, it was like they were so much against me, the attacks, the insults. So I left. And then my colleagues decided to take the form, get my picture, scan it, and put it on it. And they, they campaigned for me and then in absentia. Won. So I, I was my somewhere in Awasu doing my box site. <laughs> and then they did all the posters, Gabi, Nana Sante, Mike, uh, Alaji, Amafati, Dasibre of Blessed mm -hmm. Memory, all those the guys I grew up with in the community, they did it. And then I won in absentia. And then I became a presiding member and all. But really in school, my plan was to, okay, do business, uh, get called to the bar, become a judge. I wanted really to be at the bench. Okay. It, as for this politics, Poli it, 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 it came along the way. part of me at all. Okay. In, in, on campus, I was rather pushing others into leadership, but I never contested for any student leadership role. I was rather supporting, you know, the people. Yeah, I never people. thought I would right. get, get, get so, into So So here you are today from backbench up and now at the front bench, leading the majority side in parliament, leading parliament as a whole, as leader of the house. But your, 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 your upgrade from deputy to majority leader was not without controversy. But we had heard rumors that the party had decided to make some changes at the front bench. And then some members on the majority side, including the first deputy speaker, held a news conference to say that they were never in support of any changes in parliament. The next day, there was a meeting at the Jubilee House. The meeting ended with you as the new majority leader. Do you think your, your ascension was skewed? Was there a coup d'etat that made you leapfrog your walls to become the majority leader? Well, 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 well. MPP is a big party, and when decisions are being made, I'm sure people make their input. But I don't think people have really paid attention to Joe Weiss's uh, news, conference. news conference. You see, he said, and I try to pay attention to language, mm -hmm. he said the caucus had confidence in its leadership. Mm -hmm. The caucus was unaware of any such changes mm -hmm. and that if any of such should happen it will be announced mm -hmm. i mean i think in all fairness he made a point mm -hmm. all right you know political decisions are taken by the major stakeholders in consultation mm -hmm. so you yourself who may be in the picture may not know but I think that my boss, Chairman Sabonso, had taken time to groom me enough sufficiently to assume this role because he was the first to tell me that if we are on your year, you can become the leader of the party. Okay. And that was his first time, it, the first travel he had with me to Hanoi, Vietnam in, uh, in, 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 in 2014. Mm -hmm. And he repeated it when we got to Kenya and we're in a long transit. Mm. You know, we're waiting for almost about 24 hours for our flight to connect to Ghana. And subsequently, he actually got me to pay attention to the rules book. And anytime he had called me, he would tell me to check a particular provision in the standing orders. And whilst we were at the front seat, the whole period, Although I'm a lawyer, mm -hmm. and he is not, but the man is more than a lawyer. He's a whole institution, his appreciation of the law. Mm -hmm. You realize that he also gave me the space right. to function. Some leaders will not, but when it comes to the, the issues of law, he will prepare me. In fact, let me give it out to him. He will prepare me. I will go to him in the morning. He said, my deputy, and he would address me as bishop. Mm. He said, bishop, say why, why, why bishop? That's our code. Okay. 
say this put it this way so we we are now what can you say now we could go to we now for sure now for your own okay make sure try it you know i think during the ken must go that was a defining moment i was so tense because parliament was packed and i saw the weight of the party on me mm -hmm. You know, when you see the big lawyers behind you, you have Atachia, Katie Amon, you have Joe Weiss himself seated there, you have uh, uh, Amayo Chairman, mm -hmm. you have Animedu, you have uh, uh, the Rose Minister himself, right? Okay, Amwakwata, mm -hmm. you have Joe Gatte, former Attorney General, and these are big guys, seniors at the bar. Mm -hmm. So I said, Oh my God, help me. So I was just praying, praying my mantra, praying my mantra, and he gave me the confidence and said, Deputy, do it this way. So he had prepared the notes, and the whole parliament was packed, and the nation was expecting the party to rescue the finance minister, because we also had some internal upheaval. Of course, your own caucus yeah, right. are taking the decision so that they should go. We had to fight. And you know, when you are when you are good in procedural jurisprudence, mm -hmm. you would always have your way. So fortunately, we realized that there were a few, you know, loopholes right. in the application of the of the applicants, and we exploited it. And here we go. We got what we wanted. We got the full hearing for him, and the man was able to come out to state his side of the story. So that was the rescue number one. And rescue number two was when the report came, came to the floor and the report could not indict him. And some of the applicants themselves openly said, indeed, they could not get anything to indict. I said, come on, oh la la, then we can go with it. Mm. If you could not indict him for wrongdoing, then the man is, is free to go. But and that, 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 that experience mm -hmm. was actually catapulted by my, my boss, Jamie Sabonso. But nevertheless, I mean, what kind of relationship exists between you and Jay? Is it a good one? No, no, no. Is it, it friendly? Be. Are you leading a, a caucus that is united behind can, you? We had a good caucus meeting yesterday. Uh, we are good. He's still teaching me. Like when the, 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 the president came, though I'd gone through the precedents, I'd, I'd watched some footages of the past, I still felt that I needed to seek guidance. This is the, the, the State of the Nation address. Yeah, the State of the Nation address on, on, on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I felt that I still needed guidance. So I went to him, uh, and then we spoke. And then when we came to the floor, I was still tensed. You know, Onizi is the head that is carrying every load, OK? And I know my backbench. I, I know my back. I, you've been in parliament for about 11 years. You yeah. should, these things will come naturally. No, but that is different. There is, it's one thing doing your advocacy mm -hmm. and another thing carrying the, the entire ultimate house responsibility. So I went back to him again and as I said, so what do we do? Uh, when Mr. President is done, definitely our two will punch us and mine would be just to move the motion. So should I just move the motion or create some theatrics, you know, choreograph something that our uh, communicators will also take along. Mm -hmm. So he gave me the guide that look at here, there, and then use that to uh, get a space. At least they will have the final bite, but at least would have also gone home with something. Mm -hmm. I said, all right. So if you watch the video, he was very quiet. He had his uh, fingers on his lips, saying that, is my boy going to make it mm -hmm. or not? Okay. And when we finished, I said, how did you say? Super. Thank you. Then I thanked him. And yesterday, he guided me, he said, look, we needed to consider some few bills, certain things that we need to do. So I think the transition is good. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, so good. Um, it's whether or not the caucus will be united behind me would be dependent on my on, behavior. On what you do. And you know, attitude, posture. I, 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 if, if, and you are not just leader of your caucus, also leader of parliament. Right. Which means that you are carrying the entire house along so with So I you. told my colleagues opposite that previously I was playing number five. So if you come, I hit you. Mm. But now I'm playing number nine. If I don't take care, you will hit me. So a good striker would always play safe. Mm. So if now I'm a striker, I should be able to, you know, engage than that abrasive approach. I, I cannot 
use abrasiveness to survive. No, you can't do that. In the middle bench, as a deputy, as a whip, you can engage in pound for pound. Like today in the morning, there was so much pound for pound. I said, oh my God. About the energy and other issues. Well, in the morning in mm -hmm. Parliament this morning, but, 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 but again, on, 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 we're receiving some punches. Mm -hmm. but All right. I could not, you know, because you can't. But on, on, you are very close to Canada and Japan. Yes. Now, last week or last two weeks, you had to intervene between him and a member of Parliament for English amount from Sylvester 30. And, I mean, your intervention led to what could have become, you know, blows on the floor whilst business was being conducted on the floor of Parliament. What was the issue? You want us to discuss? Of course, we're on live television. Really? There are, isn't it the case that there are some unknown knowns and some unknown unknowns? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's it. I mean, what is important is that whatever it was, mm -hmm. we reconcile. As to the details of it, let's keep the skeletons where they are and uh, live with it. It's okay. Some say that it had to do with some money that I needed to be paid. I, you are saying, I don't know about it, Elton. What you are saying, I don't know. I'm hearing it from mm. you for the first time. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how are we able to resolve the matter between them? Later, we saw a video and picture of you in your office and the two we of them. We are politicians. Meaning that whatever the we, differences we are, were. We are politicians. Mm -hmm. We solve our problems. Okay. This is a, a family affair. The joy is that we've solved our problem. Mm -hmm. Honorable Kennedy in Japan sees his colleagues, they exchange pleasantries. Okay. All is well. All is well. Whatever that is outstanding, we we'll work at it. It is the flag bearer who must be projected with a united front to win the elections. I think that's our focus. We've got 10 minutes to go, a few issues, and then I can let you go because even as we are speaking, your phone won't stop ringing. Uh, the, um, your first business on the floor in terms of getting bills passed was the one some would say that despite your spirited defense and attempt to scatter the passage of the anti-LGBTIQ, your proposed amendment did not find favor with the speaker. They were there, the bill got passed. The bill, got, the, 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 the bill was taken to third reading. What were your concerns? Or would you consider the passage as a loss on your side? No, in a democracy, you can't get everything. You win some, you gain some. Um, I think that we've been rather too emotional as a country on this. And I'm, I'm sad for the Ghanaian politician. Why? The Ghanaian politician is overly thinking about how to win the next election. The Ghanaian politician, when confronted with a challenge, is unable to be firm and say, look, damn the consequences. If in doing this, I will lose out, I should lose out. Mm. You see, we are dealing with a very serious matter. Elton, I'm a private sector person. Mm -hmm. I, I hear and I see. I'm a practitioner of the law. Mm -hmm. I hear and I see. I'm a family man. I'm a father. I hear and I see. I don't want to pretend about this. As a businessman, are you worried but, about the implications on your business? Because as, you probably as, as a Ghanaian, I'm worried about everything. And Elton, allow me, let me explain mm -hmm. something. You, I know you read a lot. But Elton, be honest with me. This bill, have you read it in full? Not in full, I must Thank admit. you very much. Why so? Because it keeps People changing. People, I spoke to some it of It keeps your, changing. Look, Elton, I spoke to somebody in multimedia. I said, Osi Messi, I know you to be a strong advocate. Why didn't you say A, B, C? Say, oh, honorable. If we can kind of want Kenya, Rebecca said, we are lesbian and now we are gay. In Tino, I decided to keep quiet. I said, really? When I was expressing my own views, I have very bosom <clears throat> friends who were coming to me, who oh, come now because of your future. I said, what future? Look, I don't mind. If the people of Efutu will say, Look, these were your views, so sit at home. I will. I am yet to take certain decisions. I miss court. Eh? I miss this is this is a case that I would have I would have given it my all at the Supreme Court. A group, court. some NGOs say that they I, may go to the Supreme I, Court. I, I miss if President Akufo Addo signed. No, they don't need the to wait. They don't to, need to, to, to wait for, for signing or rejection. Mm -hmm. They don't need to wait. You know, but the point is that how do we incarcerate a person 
because of a sexual behavior. Okay? Mm -hmm. Two, what are the conditions in our prisons? Nothing. Ultra conservative thinking alone cannot be used to develop a nation. Mm -hmm. You need a mix of it. I am not here to promote gayism. I will never, ever say that same-sex marriage should be legalized. I will never, ever encourage anybody to engage in sexual intercourse with the same sex. Mm. However, should a person engage in this, the means of reforming, the means of drawing the person's attention that, to the fact that what you are doing is not part of our social values, will not be to say that go to jail. Mm -hmm. By the way, by the way, in prison, in prison, the situation there is worse. But those who oppose your amendment says that you propose a law that has no grounds in no, law because wrong. there is no it, law that, 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 that encourages non-custodial sentence. don't mind them. In the minimum, I know my law. Mm -hmm. Elton, in the minimum, I know my law. Those people who were saying that, they don't understand what they were saying. In any event, the law that they were also urging on us to pass, they didn't have any foundation in any subsetting law. Please, we are passing a law. We are creating repercussions, mm -hmm. consequence of your breach. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that you have in there a fine. You have in there a custodial center. Mm -hmm. I said, look, you can keep the fine. But what is the essence? The object of the bill is to ensure that Ghanaians or in Ghana, we observe proper human value and family systems. Mm -hmm. Not so? Right. If it is so, are we not supposed to put in the pillars that would enable the person to reform? Will an incarceration be the correction that we require as a nation? No. That is why I introduced the community service. But like I said, people are not paying attention. Look, when I moved a motion for secret ballot, mm -hmm. and Mr. Speaker actually ignored, right? Mm -hmm. I, on three occasions, I called on Mr. Speaker to exercise discretion on secret ballot. Do you know why? I was receiving a lot of text messages. From your members? From MPs, not my members. No, no, from, like uh, across yes, the board? Especially those on the NDC side who were in their offices and watching who were sitting in the chamber saying that, leader, if you are able to push for secret ballot, who will come and vote. Because people are worried. But they fear. People have been made to believe that if you dare you will speak oppose against any, it, then you are any provision, it. Mm -hmm. then your constituency, you will suffer. Why so? I am not worried. I had to state my position. That we support you. For instance, that aspect where an adult will introduce a child a minor into homosexuality. I support the custodial sentence as a consequence of that action. I support it mm -hmm. in total. All right? The pedophile aspect. Yes, mm -hmm. I support it. Because you are an adult. You use something to entice a child. Like uh, I heard my professor, uh, Moses Fuamweni, mm -hmm. talking about some research findings in Elmina. Exactly. Where there are some uh, white guys. Five, 50 Ghana you, cities and they are inserting all manner of things into the private one, part of this. That one you go to jail mm -hmm. because you are an adult. That child does not have a mens. Mm -hmm. And you try to use something to entice him or her. So for those ones, we are adding them. The fact that we should say same-sex relationship is not lawful. We are adding them. Mm -hmm. But if you say that me, if I know you all tend to be a gay and I don't go and report you, I am, I am, I am liable. Have you heard this before? Well, I, I think... I, uh, no, yes. Mm -hmm. If the, the provision in the law, mm -hmm. which says that if you know somebody to be one and you don't report, you are liable. What's, what, what kind of law is that? Oh, no, but before, I, no, because no, of time... I, I mean, maybe the we have media, time. The media in Ghana mm -hmm. should spend time to interrogate all the provisions fully. You see, don't let us get carried away. That if you talk about it, hey, it means that you support gayism. That is the scare, the fear that that seems to have been planted in there. So great minds are just one question. To just one question for just thirty seconds. You are a lawyer. If you are given the opportunity to advise President Kufuado, what position will you advise no, 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 that he no, take? No, 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 no. I'm not going to answer you on that.
I'm Why? Going to answer you. No, this is a, a, a personal let, view. Let, let, the let, president is, let, is a let, human rights lawyer. No, no, no. He, will have, he, I, will, he will have his day. I but am, if, I, if I are given the opportunity I, I am, to... I am unable to answer that. All right. We'll have another time for this conversation. Thank you very much. The Thank majority you. leader of Ghana's parliament, Alexander Fanyamakin. Well, that's our show for this uh, Friday's edition. Monday, we'll be back. For more stories, log on to our website, myjoyonline.com. My name is Elton Robe. Have a lovely weekend.